I'd like the, to bring the planning board meeting for September 17th to order. Uh, we have some new correspondence in front of us, uh, which we'd like to take a minute or two to make sure everybody has read it, and then we'll uh, begin our evening. Motion's been made and seconded that the minutes for uh, August 20th meeting is uh, accepted as presented. Uh, all those in favor? So. The minutes are record. Mr. Chairman, before we get into tonight's uh, hearing, I just did want to state on the record that uh, I did not attend the July public hearing, but I have since that time watched the hearing on videotape, so I've been made aware of all of the presentations made during the July public hearing. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that while I did not watch the videotape of the, of the meeting, I have read the minutes and all related correspondence, and I have gone on a site walk myself of the uh, Shore Road property. I would also uh, on my situation, I did not make the site walk, but I did walk the site to, and uh, feel as though I'm current on the issues. The uh, first item of business tonight is the Blueberry Ridge Subdivision Resource Pro Protection Permit, a request uh, by Joe Fristacci to table review of Blueberry Ridge, a 19-lot subdivision off of Mitchell Road. <coughs> Chairman, in light of the applicant's request that we table the discussion until next month, I'd like to offer a motion to do just that. Please do. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of Joseph Pistacci for so final subdivision review and a resource protection permit for Blueberry Ridge, a 19-lot subdivision located off Mitchell Road, be tabled to the regular October 15, 2002 meeting of the planning board. Motion's been made. I hear it. And, uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion show by raising the right hand. <coughs> motion carries. The uh, second item on our agenda this evening is Cape Health Center site plan. Uh, Dr. Craig Johnson, also doing business as Fox Trot Properties LLC, is requesting site plan review for the conversion of the existing building located at 1226 Shore Road to the Cape Health Center, a medical office with two proposed additions and a new two-car garage. The site was converted from a single-family home to a town community center in 1991. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations and Section 19-6-4 Town Center design requirements. Would the applicant uh, bring us up to date with any changes, please? Mr. Chairman, before we begin discussion of this, I'd like to disclose for the record that I've been a patient of the practice for the past 10 years, as has my family, and I don't believe that will inhibit my ability to review the project objectively, but I've wanted um, my fellow board members' concurrence that I should not recuse myself or their opinion that I should. regarding her request. Any reason why? So, as a board, uh, we'd accept your request. Is the board then saying I should recuse myself, or? Is there any other? No. no. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Wilcox. I've been working on design for the uh, health center with Dr. Johnson. And I guess the first thing that we'd like to do this evening uh, is give you a couple of updates on, on uh, what's been uh, uh, proceeding with the design of the plans uh, since we last met at the site walk. Uh, I'll do a quick update uh, on the revisions to the plans, and then Dr. Johnson uh, has some material uh, to update you on also that has to do with the nature of the, the practice and uh, and the uh, and his decision to locate at the uh, 
at the former community center. Uh, the, uh, I'll just run pretty quickly through the additions to the plan, mo plans, most of them uh, uh, at the request of uh, the review. Uh, in the package uh, that you have this month, uh, the meets and bounds have been added. Uh, the area, uh, an area diagram of the addition in each phase has been added on the, the separate drawing for each phase uh, so that uh, it, it's pretty clear in order to be able to tell how the area of the overall structure relates to the footprint uh, requirement in the town center zone. Uh, the uh, garage has been uh, slightly enlarged. Uh, it's been made a foot wider and two feet longer. Uh, the plans show it uh, as being 25 by 26 now. Uh, and it also has, instead of uh, one single door, it has two, instead of one double, I should say, overhead door for the garage, it has two single overhead doors, which is uh, as much a convenience uh, uh, function as anything else. Uh, the town engineer noted in his review that uh, to be consistent, uh, an area diagram should be done for the garage also. Uh, that can be added to the plans uh, without any trouble at all. Uh, the, uh, one of the uh, items that uh, uh, we noted last month that uh, perhaps uh, could be borne out again is that uh, biohazard waste will not be uh, and, and something that uh, is attended to uh, uh, as part of uh, use of the property other than the fact that it is done by an independent contractor and uh, done in sealed containers and taken to uh, and disposed of properly at an approved bio biohazard incinerator site. Uh, we have also, uh, in the course of the past month, verified the, that there is enough water available to serve the building. Uh, and, uh, and based on the flows available at the, at, the, uh, at the water main in the street for the neighborhood and uh, at the service to the building itself, uh, you should have a letter from the Portland Water District, uh, as well as the demand requirements uh, in your packages. Uh, another item uh, that we uh, have added to the plans is that the edge of uh, existing vegetation uh, has been sort of denoted, in addition to being the edge of the existing vegetation, uh, to also be uh, the, uh, the limit of clearing work, if you will, uh, in, an, in an effort to define that existing wooded area to the east of the house uh, as a uh, wooded buffer zone. Uh, to, to keep its existing plantings uh, as well as have the added landscaping that's shown on the landscaping plans added to it. Uh, there's a little, uh, it, it could be more, uh, it could be more precisely shown uh, in that uh, the edge of the woods is shown all along the side closest to the house, uh, but the limit of clearing uh, is not shown along the fence line itself. Uh, that could be uh, added to the plans uh, very easily because it is the entire zone uh, between the house and the existing yard and the, and the fence line, if you will, uh, to which that designation would apply. Uh, and in going further in, in that respect, uh, the, uh, the, the note uh, has been added to read uh, that it would preclude work except for uh, the removal of uh, dead or dying uh, plant materials in that zone. Uh, we, can go, we can go further as of this meeting and just uh, uh, give an additional bit of information that uh, a, a, an arborist will be reviewing the trees along the edge of the clearing uh, for their uh, health safety, uh, and viability. Uh, and that information would then uh, relate to any future decisions on, on taking out individual, uh, individual plants or trees. Uh, another item uh, that has uh, recently happened but was, did not happen in time for your packages tonight, uh, just as of this afternoon, uh, we have received 
uh, a design for a new septic system from Frick Associates, uh, which is intended to be used uh, during, for the phase two portion of the project, uh, if in fact connection to the sewer is not possible at that time. Uh, so that is something that we have tonight. Uh, if you wish to look at it later on, uh, during the discussion or after the public hearing, we have copies uh, available to you. Uh, or uh, it's something we have at any rate. Uh, it was prepared after consultation uh, by Mr. Frick uh, with Mr. Smith, the code enforcement officer, uh, and was prepared at his direction. Uh, and it's based on uh, an increase in the staffing and activity levels that would happen in phase two because of the additional examination rooms, and it's not based on the plumbing fixtures per se. Uh, so it does uh, sort of follow the requirements of the main, main uh, plumbing code in that respect. Uh, the final item I would like to add is that we, uh, as a result of the site walk, uh, we've looked again at uh, the appropriateness of having a sidewalk along the front of the property and have come to the conclusion, uh, especially after the site walk and looking at the uh, immediate location of the building, uh, that a sidewalk would not be appropriate for the project. Uh, the house being uh, something that's uh, designed to be more like a house in the residential A zone, uh, since it does, uh, for all practical purposes, immediately border on that zone and not on other business uses in town center. Uh, also, the fact that it would be a somewhat steep sidewalk. Uh, another feature of it is that there is what appears to be a, a paddock with an electrified fence and a working agricultural use immediately across the street, and as such, uh, might uh, be seen at this point in time at any rate as something that detracts from the rural character, which is found on the fringes of the town center zone. and. That is something which is uh, referred to, uh, as you're aware, in the uh, master plan for the town. So I would like to just point those things out in closing and uh, turn it over to Dr. Johnson to add a few more things on. Thank you. One item that came up when I reviewed the uh, memorandum for the meeting tonight, uh, and Mark pointed this out to me too, is the issue of uh, number of trips, uh, number of patient visits, and the need to do a uh, traffic uh, report or traffic intersection report should the uh, number of, uh, <clears throat> it was stated, if the traffic generation exceeds 100 peak hour trips. Uh, I assume that means more than 100 people per day visiting the site. Is that how that's viewed, or how is that uh, defined? Ready? Would you? It's, it's, it's trip is actually a, a departure and an arrival. And it's calculated by traffic engineers. and. I won't even pretend to know the intricacies of traffic engineering, but it's not an exact correlation between number of patients and number of trips. For example, the standard number of trips for a single family home is 10 trips a day. So it appears that the board wants us to make a, or, or create some sort of a traffic report uh, should the build-out exceed this 100 peak hour trips, I guess the question is, at what point or how do we go about deciding that we've reached that, that uh, 100 peak hour trips? <clears throat> how does that relate to the use of the building, the number of patients going in, and uh, et cetera? There's um, an institute of traffic engineering where they have spent years 
doing traffic studies on all different types of uses of all different sizes and they've actually counted the number of trips that say go in and out of the McDonald's and so that at this point in time they don't have to count the number of trips of a brand new McDonald's because they have enough <coughs> background data that they can accurately predict how many trips that would generate. So they have created a manual called the Institute of Traffic Engineering Trip Generation Manual. And if you go in there, more than likely there will be a standard number of trips that could be generated for a medical office of a certain size. So as I understand it, then we would have to obtain that information before the full build-out is obtained? Is that how this is written? That would probably be the easiest thing to do. And, you know, if you, uh, Mark probably knows some traffic engineers, um, but you could probably call an office that has that book, and they could probably take 10 minutes to open it up, look it up. You could tell them the size of your medical office building. They could probably give you a number over the phone of what you thought the trips would be. And I would, if I were you, I'd do for the full build-out, because my guess is that even at full build-out, you're probably under the 100 trips. But that's just a guess on my part. So in reading this, it appears as if this issue would not stand in the way of the phase one of build-outs. Is that correct? I, I'm trying to understand where this sits and how this relates to approval I, of I this think, project. Uh, I think the ease of access obtaining that information and, and the requ we would require that um, prior to the, to the permit being issued even for the phase one build out? Yes. I mean, this, this is something new that you've just released to us, this information here. We talked about the traffic flow pattern, and it appeared not to be an issue prior to uh, when you handed out this memorandum. Yeah. Dr. Johnson, it's a standard in the site plan regulations. Um, so, you know, when when you first submitted your application, um, the application says that you have read the regulations and, and you know what they say, and, and this is something that is required of every project. And there just needs to be something submitted to the board so that they can basically say, okay, we've gotten this information, because otherwise they can't make a finding that you've met that standard. So relating to you, the, the, what the expected use of the building is the number of patients coming and going is not going to suffice tonight to, uh, for the board to consider that standard met? I, I, I think, excuse me for jumping in, one, one possible approach would be to, if we were inclined to approve the project, assuming there are no other issues, that could be a condition of the approval, and, the, and there is actually a proposed motion which includes that as a condition so that you would you could potentially get approval this evening uh, contingent upon obtaining that study. Okay. That is important to us this evening. Uh, because in the, uh, in the memorandum that I referred to, which is dated September 17th, uh, from Maureen O'Meara to the planning board, there are two motions that she allows. I mean, motion A is to table the project. If this project is tabled, you will have, in effect, shut us down until spring or summer. We've been enduring conditions at the 155 Spurwink Avenue location that some would find intolerable. And my staff has been wonderful, and the patients have been very understanding in terms of what we've had to go through. We desperately need the space that the phase one build out is going to provide for us in the building. The project is on track now. The board must move to approve the project tonight. The second motion is for approval. I believe that we've satisfied, except now perhaps for this one traffic issue, all of the other requirements that the board has set, except for one and that is the sidewalk issue. I do not believe that the requirement to install a minimum five-foot grass esplanade and a five-foot sidewalk, the length of the property, from the current driveway across the front lawn 
through the woods and all the way to the Rand's property is reasonable or practical. There is no sidewalk along Shore Road for this to connect to. There will be none in the foreseeable future. The Rands and the Murrays, my neighbors and abutters, have no interest or desire to extend a sidewalk across their lawns, especially at their own expense. You're asking me to shoulder a cost of many thousands of dollars to support a vision of a sidewalk along Shore Road. It's money that I do not have. It's money that if I had, I would not agree to spend. Such a sidewalk is going to create a water flow problem along Shore Road. And for my neighbors to the east, the Rands, at present, the water flows gradually off the road, onto the lawn, and into the woods beside the house. The sidewalk that you propose that I construct would block the water from flowing off the road, cause pooling of water on Shore Road, and then cause the water to drain onto the property of the Rands. This becomes a risk to cars traveling along Shore Road. This is unacceptable to the Rands as well. And I understand you have a letter from them, and I shall read that letter shortly. We discussed this when we held the sidewalk. Comments that were forthcoming from members of this committee suggesting that I pay additional monies to install a drainage system to correct this condition are beyond what I think is reasonable and appropriate to require of an applicant to this board. Installing a five-foot-wide sidewalk with an attached five-foot-wide esplanade will require digging out and removing a wide swath from not only the front lawn, but from the woods as well. This is a community that prides itself on having a rural flavor. There are horses and trees across the street. Replacing lawn and trees with concrete and pavement is not what this community seeks. Some of you have suggested that a strip of sidewalk along the frontage of this property helps to answer the pedestrian and bicycle issue along Shore Road. Let me remind you that Shore Road extends three miles to Fort Williams. This sidewalk will have no impact on this problem. If you want to address the pedestrian and bicycle issues, then you need to revisit the entire discussion involved around widening of Shore Road. In 1991, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council assembled a group of citizens to serve on the Town Center Planning Committee. The committee was charged with defining the town center area, recommending setback requirements, preparing a vision for the town center, and developing a town center plan. This plan was completed in 1993. It was the product of a tremendous investment of time, energy, and thought by citizens of this town. It was presented and accepted by the town council. It became the basis upon which the town center district ordinances were created. The committee tackled many issues, including that of where the sidewalks should be installed. The town center plan includes five visionary designs for what could be or what should be the future design for the center. Let me just share with you scheme A. I've, I've highlighted the property at, one, at 1226 Shore Road for your convenience. Notice that a sidewalk is specifically omitted from in front of this property. This committee went to lengths to identify what they felt was a reasonable and desirable system of sidewalks for the town center. They concluded that it was neither reasonable nor desirable to have a sidewalk at that location. Schemes B, C, and D, you might as well hand them all out. bound upon their visions, and none show a sidewalk out in front of this property. The fifth and final scenario, labeled possible future development scenario, shows an extensive system of pathways and bikeways through the town center. Here too, they specifically omitted this property from having a sidewalk out in front. The ordinance states simply that a sidewalk should, it says should, not shall, 
should be constructed parallel to the front facade. That's what the ordinance states. From this simple statement, the planning board is prepared to insist that I construct a five foot wide sidewalk along the entire length of the frontage of this lot and to provide for a five foot esplanade strip between the sidewalk and shore road. I am furthermore forbidden as I weave this sidewalk through the woods from cutting down any tree or brush with a caliper of four inches or greater. I think I've presented ample reasons why the sidewalk should not be required. I think I've presented some proof that those who came together to create the town center plan specific, specifically chose not to put a sidewalk in front of this property. And one final point. The town owned this property from 1991 until I purchased it in June of this year. During this time, no one from the town, no citizen, no town employee found any reason to install a sidewalk along Shore Road in front of this property. If I'd gone to the town council and proposed that the town pay to install such a sidewalk, I think I know what the response would have been. I think they would have said why. I think I would have been laughed out of the meeting. Now I say why. Why force me to put a sidewalk where there is no need? I'd like to read that letter from Dr. and Mrs. Rand, uh, my neighbors in Abutters on Shore Road. And this letter came to me yesterday at the office. It was completely unsolicited and it was a surprise on my part, but quite welcome. And let me read. It's dated September 13, 2002 to Marino Mirror Town Planner, Town Offices, 320 Ocean House Road, Cape Elizabeth. Dear Maureen, unfortunately neither Alice nor I will be able to be at the public hearing regarding Dr. Johnson's application for 1226 Shore Road next Tuesday. As next door neighbors, we do have some concerns which we ask you share with the members of the planning board for their consideration. First, we were very pleased to learn that the building was to become a doctor's office rather than to be converted into a restaurant or any of the several other high use and potentially obtrusive structures and activities allowed in the sound center plan. That plan, I'm afraid, does not provide adequate buffer for the private landowner who by dint of evolving ordinances becomes an abutter to disquieting non-residential activities. But we certainly are worried and disappointed by the requirement the town hopes to impose on Dr. Johnson to build a sidewalk on Shore Road. It seems absurd with no sidewalks from Ocean House Road to the property to build an impervious unconnected strip of asphalt simply to satisfy all the goals of the town center plan. As it is, because of a long buried culvert, rainwater ponds beside the road in front of our house, then flows down our drive driveway, eroding the blacktop before it ends up in our cellar. We sincerely don't want this problem increased. Our disappointment comes from what appears to be unfairness. And having developed over a couple of decades of civic involvement, a high respect for the way the town does business, we don't find that a comfortable word to use. Simply put, how can the town, which had an opportunity to build a sidewalk during the several years it owned the property, but didn't, now require a private citizen to build one? Building a sidewalk was not a stipulation that Dr. Johnson was fully aware of before he bought the property. He's been misled, and that's a shame. Sincerely, Peter and Alice Rand. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to open up uh, the project to a, a public hearing. If there's anybody in the audience that uh, has anything that they would like to discuss on this issue, please step to the podium. I would suggest that uh, if there are a lot of people that uh, <coughs> we hold it to roughly three minutes, um, and uh, at this time, anybody in interested in talking about this subject, please step to the podium. Mr. Chairman and 
members of the board, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Rand uh, sent me a copy of the same letter that was just read by Dr. Johnson. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I won't read it again. But uh, I wanted to just talk about two points. I was a member of the council, and I'm not speaking for the town council now. I'm speaking as a private citizen. My name is Henry Berry. I live at 110 Two Lights Road in Cape Elizabeth, and I think most of the folks know me. Um, I, I think that uh, at the time that we negotiated the sale of this property to Dr. Johnson, it was represented that there was a, uh, a sewer connection was uh, contemplated. I understand that that's been taken care of now. Uh, the uh, council was presented with a proposal to build a sewer there, but they said no, because there's a septic, tank, a septic system that works now that uh, will let that work as long as it, uh, it will. And if that begins to fail, then the council will revisit the uh, issue of the sewer system. So I think that issue is, has been uh, resolved. As far as the sidewalk, uh, I, I don't see any good reason to put a sidewalk where uh, the, the bank has none, uh, the next property has none, the Murray property has a pile of sand there, and I don't think he wants a, a sidewalk for that. And on the other side, Dr. Rand is very concerned about uh, his property with the water and uh, also the sidewalk to nowhere. Uh, if bicycle paths and pedestrian paths are to be uh, run up the shore road, uh, that is an entirely new issue that will have to be revisited by the council because that issue was decided six years ago. Um, so I, I think that uh, Dr. Johnson uh, should be given some consideration here, bought the property, not ever expecting to have a sidewalk required, and now this has uh, sprung up sort of from nowhere, and it's a surprise to him. Uh, I think in essence he has been misled. I know that there is the slogan, let the buyer beware, but I think the town in dealing with Dr. Johnson has to be fair. And if it's to be fair, I think he does not need a sidewalk going from nowhere to nowhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Susan Berry, and I also live at 110 Two Lights Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, when I came in tonight, um, I saw a friend of mine, Patricia Austin, uh, who came here but was ill, and um, asked me to read this letter to you. Um, it's dated 9-17-2002. To whom it concerns, the Planning Board of Cape Elizabeth, I have very strong feelings against Dr. Johnson having to put in a sidewalk. I think this is, a, is an unnecessary obstacle for this fine and much needed professional contribution to the Cape Elizabeth community. Please let this letter stand for me. I am too ill to stay for this meeting. She said she'd like to see Dr. Johnson, but I said he's busy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Respectfully, Patricia Austin, and I'll just turn this letter over to you uh, because she's not here to read it herself. Um, I have spent some time going over the, the uh, town center plan, and it's a marvel of um, citizen involvement and uh, thorough planning. Um, however, and, um, in concept, it's an it's a absolutely lovely concept, and if I were looking for a place to expand my business, I certainly would be attracted to it. Um, uh, However, the, um, as Dr. Johnson pointed out, the, the, um, the five um, c contemplated plans do not include a sidewalk in front of that, in front of that particular building, and I, I personally would have been misled by it. And I also kind of wonder, um, it, it appears that because the Methodist Church is part of the town center, um, that if they do any expansion, they're going to have to put a sidewalk in, and I wonder if they know that. Um, uh, I was also interested in the extensive um, planning of significant vegetation, and it appears that on the map and 
this plan of significant vegetation. There is significant vegetation already um, in front of doc what we hope will soon be Dr. Johnson's office. Um, uh, and I, I'm, I fear that it will be disrupted. And everything I read about the concept of this plan, for instance, having a courtyard-like entrance with vegetation and so on and so forth, um, that Dr. Johnson's practice and the building itself is a perfect fit, um, except for the sidewalk, which um, I, I think is uh, obstructionist. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Oh, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to say. I, I wrote a letter to the council um, saying that Dr. Johnson was a, a man of um, conscious, conscientiousness and integrity, and I wanted wanted to add one more word, and that is compassion. And when I looked at the zoning ordinance, 19.2.3 or something like that, um, I see that there is leeway in the sidewalk issue um, to allow uh, flexibility in the, the town center plan. And I would like to ask you to be compassionate in allowing this business to um, to happen there as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Gary Punsky, and I am a resident of this town. And I was just curious, whose idea is it to put a sidewalk? Who from the town uh, came up with the idea that they should put a sidewalk in front of that property? It, it, it's part of the ordinance and the and the the uh, code for the town center section. This this property happens to be in the town center section, and that's part of the ordinance that uh, um, requires any changes in use to comply with the current zone. Okay. Well, I think under the circumstances, that an exception should, should definitely be made because I I went by the property today and I took, took a good look at it. I can't believe that anybody would expect Dr. Johnson to put on a sidewalk, as other people have said earlier, that begins and ends nowhere. It's like putting a bridge out in the middle of a pond, but don't connect it to the shores, either side of the shoreline. It just doesn't seem reasonable to me. Uh, another matter, when the town first purchased that property back, I think it was in 91, did they do a traffic study before they put it in a community center? I, I have no way of knowing that. Okay. Because I just get the feeling that if someone comes before the board, that the planning board here in this town that they held hostage, and they, the, I just my feeling is that the board can just order up things that they want the applicant to, to do, and these are hoops and hurdles that I don't always easily achieve, and I think it's very unreasonable, and I think he should be commended for having the vision to put in a doctor's office in a town that really needs that type of service, and I would strongly urge everybody to approve this plan very timely. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Peggy Farnsworth, and I live at 7 Wentworth Road. Um, I feel as though it would be very unjust to have Dr. Johnson have to go to the expense of putting in a sidewalk at a time when he's just, just getting started. I think his, his medical building would be a tremendous asset to the center of the town. And um, I, I just would like to have you oversee, over, you know, look that. I think he's got a great plan, and I think we'll all benefit by it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Carl Pearson, former town councilor and actually a member of the town center planning committee. Uh, so all this wonderful detail that everyone's been going through is very familiar to me. Um, I do want to point out a couple of things. First of all, I'll apologize here, but I, I want to do something that Dr. Johnson's patients have been subjected to recently, and maybe this will make you appreciate how urgent it is that you approve this tonight. <laughs> That's just a small hint of the amount of banging and clanging and stuff that goes on in their doctor's office and of which all us patients have been subject to. And I apologize that, not for dramatic effect, but he has been 
a patient doctor to and for his patients. Uh, so the approval of this tonight is definitely uh, a bigger issue than the sidewalks. As far as the sidewalks, on page 24 on the recommendations of the town center planning committee, and these are instructions, if you will, to the town uh, as recommended by the committee, that the town should construct and reconstruct sidewalks throughout the town center if sidewalk construction is to be phased, first priority should be construction of sidewalks along both sides of Shore Road, extending from the community center to Town Hall and from the Scout House to the Methodist Church. Phase two should include extending sidewalks to the shopping center and reconstruction of sidewalks on Scott Dyer Road. Phase three should complete the extension of sidewalks on Route 77 to the Fowler Road, Old Ocean House Road intersection. Uh, this is a recommendation because the town center has never been defined as a town center. Cape Elizabeth lacks a cohesive town center, thus the reason for this report. The town, like a developer, is trying to encourage doctor's office and other uses compatible with this plan to locate here, to put the burden on those businesses and whatnot to have that construction done at their expense is foolish. No developer would do that when developing a subdivision and say, hey, homeowner, put in your sidewalk when you build your house. That's ludicrous. Also, and I may get the wrong part of the standard here, but it's been mentioned that as part of the town center plan, there is a requirement that businesses put in sidewalks. I'm reading from paragraph C, section 19-9-5, pedestrian circulation. I'm not reading the whole thing, but I just want to put here, quote, system of pedestrian walkways within a development appropriate to the type and scale of the development. The system shall connect the building with the entrance and exit with parking areas and with existing or planned sidewalks. It does not mean that you put in those sidewalks. It means from the front of his building, he connects to. Already and when the town center 1226 Shore Road was designed by the town, it was as shown in the five plans there, to be the ending point of the town center. The pedestrian access way was going to be in a circular motion around the back of the town hall. And I think that's achieved the way that it is set up now. So I don't think the sidewalk issue is even an issue. And as far as the traffic count, and this has always been a gripe, and Maureen can make a face at me. But where all this information, especially when we have a full-time planner, as far as the traffic counts, is available in a booklet that is well known, and all you should be doing, yes, I know that the developer is supposed to have the burden of proof here, but wouldn't it be nice and towards the actual town center plan if we said, Dr. Johnson, we have the information, how many patients, we can determine the traffic count from this manual. I mean, that's almost ludicrous to have that point even being a condition point. Thank you. My name is Joe Arnold. I'm also a patient of Dr. Johnson's. I live at 47 Stony Brook Road, so I'm also a neighbor. Um, I certainly can't speak as eloquently as everyone else has to the issue of the, of the sidewalk, but, um, and I'm in here in support, of course, of the total project. But um, I know what common sense is, and I know what fairness is, and surely to, to make to Dr. Johnson put a sidewalk there uh, makes no sense, and it really just would be not fair. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? At this time, I will close the public hearing. And uh, at this time, uh, there may be some issues that board members would like to speak to. Ms. Shanklin. I would like to say that I'd like to go on record as saying uh, that I agree with everything that Dr. Johnson has said. I missed the sidewalk and I went over to the property today and I said this is not right. And we've got nice wild vegetation there which should stay where it is. It made no sense to me at all and I think that we may have an ordinance. I think we have to be rational with an ordinance and I also think that the fact that the town owned this property makes a huge difference. The town never put in a sidewalk, and I think we need to take that in under great consideration. Yes, it's true somebody else had to put in a sidewalk recently who was closer to Route 77, 
this is a different situation i really think it is because the town owns the property if it was so important the town should have put it in and i'll go on record as saying that and obviously everybody knows how i would vote about this particular point I uh, certainly appreciate all of the comments uh, that the uh, speakers have made tonight. I, I do take great exception to the implication that the town planner is not helpful to applicants in bringing them through the process. Uh, to the contrary, I think she is indeed very helpful. And uh, I don't think it's necessary to label the members of the board as obstructionist or unfair. Uh, we do have an ordinance to uh, adhere to, and that's what I'm going to focus on in my comments right now. Uh, the uh, uh, page 85 of the version of the ordinance that, that is in front of me speaks in terms of landscaping and site development. And it uses the word should in certain places and it uses the word shall in certain places. Uh, so for example, when it talks about the distinctive entrance for pedestrians going to the front of the building, that's a shall, that's a requirement. Uh, which would lead me to believe that we don't have very much discretion in altering that requirement. On the other hand, uh, with respect to the sidewalk and pedestrian pathways, it says that should be located. Uh, and I'm grappling with whether that is something that we strongly encourage or require, and it appears to be something that we strongly encourage. I believe with respect to the Scout House project, the applicant said, gee, we'd rather not do this, but we will if the board requires it. It didn't seem that they were quite as opposed to the sidewalk and concept as this particular applicant is. Uh, so it appears to me, uh, kind of echoing some of, of uh, Barbara's comments, that we have some discretion here. Uh, uh, so given that, uh, and given a lot of the comments here tonight, I'm less convinced of the requirement for a sidewalk in this, with respect to this particular application. I, I just want to say that I, I'm a little bit mystified by the the argument that this requirement and this provision in the town center ordinance is is a surprise to the applicant or to to anyone else. As, as I understand it, this ordinance has been was implemented when in 1993. 1995. 1995. So it's been seven years of an ordinance saying that there should be a sidewalk in any property in the town center district, which is all we have to go by. And to somehow say that this just came up in the last couple of weeks, I, I, I just I don't understand that argument. Um, in, in all its wisdom, the town council and the town center committee decided that this particular property was part of the town center. They further decided that all properties in the town center uh, should have sidewalks in front of them. And the idea of a sidewalk going to nowhere is only because properties that existed and have done no modification prior to the ordinance obviously didn't have to comply with the ordinance until they do. So, and I think Mr. Pearson's comments confirm that the that the committee was thinking of having sidewalks that went around the corner and, and went uh, down Shore Road in the, in the town center district. If they didn't want to do that, then the ordinance would have said, I presume, that sidewalks need not be constructed after this particular boundary. But it doesn't say that. Uh, what, what we have to go by says that anything in the town center district, which includes both properties that are right on uh, the town center, the front of the district, and properties around the corner, which they chose to include, have all these same requirements. We can't say that the lighting requirement should apply to uh, a property on one side of the town center district, but not, not another, because that's not the way the ordinance was written. So I, I, I too, am wondering what they had in mind when, when, when they included these properties in the town center district, but, but that's what they did. And they required all the same lighting and design requirements for those properties as they did for the ones uh, around. And, and 
I, I, you can point at the, the diagram, but the fact is, if they meant to make a distinction, then they could have made a distinction in the ordinance. Um, we didn't write the ordinance. That, that's what the ordinance says. And if you want to talk about fairness and unfairness, the next applicant in the town center is going to come to us and say, well, why do we have to put a sidewalk in? Because you didn't make the other applicants put a sidewalk in. And why do we have to comply with the design requirements or the lighting requirements? Because you, you could waive it for all the other applicants. And I don't think that's what the town center design standards had in mind. I think it was supposed to be consistent. That was the whole idea of the, of the town center. So uh, while I think one could argue this property shouldn't be included in the town center because it's a different character, that might be, that might be true. But in deciding what was included and not included in the town center, they decided to include this property as well as the property across the street uh, in the town center district. Mr. Charles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to echo Mr. Sherman's comments about the town planner. Uh, I think you will find few towns in Maine that have a level of professionalism and dedication anywhere close to what Maureen brings, and she's always extremely helpful both to the board and to the applicants. Uh, and just one clarification on this requirement for a traffic count. The issue is not whether you go to a book and decide how many, whether the number of trips surpasses a threshold. The issue is whether the number of trips in and out of this particular business would have any impact on the Shore Road Route 77 Scott Dyer intersection. And if it does have an impact, then there's more work to be done to make sure that it doesn't degrade the quality of service at that intersection for all of us who live here. So it, it sounds like a bureaucratic requirement, but it's really targeted at making sure that we live in a place where the traffic flow is safe at the major intersections. As, as regards to the, as relates to the sidewalk, um, I think Mr. Serraldo hits it right on the head. We, part of our job here is to, is to enforce and apply the ordinance in a reasonable way. And we do have discretion in some areas. If we were to apply the ordinance 100% strictly to this application, we would not only require a sidewalk, we'd require plantings of trees in the esplanade, and we'd also require you to tear out the front of the building, which is now a blank wall, and make that your front door. But you know, we try to be reasonable and apply the ordinance in ways that make sense. Sometimes it's just a judgment call. Uh, these drawings are hypothetical drawings done eight or ten years ago as the town center plan was put together. And they do show a sidewalk going up to but not in front of the building. I take that as hypothetical. The ordinance was written and it said it's in the town center district. It should have a sidewalk. And in my opinion, there should be a sidewalk there. If there's an issue with drainage, um, it was not pointed out to us at the site walk. And the statement that I heard was that drainage would not be a problem should a sidewalk be installed. But if there is one, then... Uh, my suggestion is maybe we need to table this till next month so you have more time to work on it. Uh, if, if you really think that's a major issue, and I'd look for some input from you on that. Uh, the comment about why didn't the town put a sidewalk in? If the town of Cape Elizabeth had submitted a site plan to this board after the ordinance was passed, they would have had to put a, a sidewalk in. But the town owned the property before the ordinance was passed. It's a patchwork. We're never going to get side, sidewalks throughout the town center district unless we start having people install them as their properties come up for site plan review. We can't go to somebody who's existed the way they are now for 20 years and say, put a sidewalk in. But we can say, when you modify your property, that's one of the things that we're asking you to do. And as was pointed out, that requirement has been on the books now for seven years. I think it's appropriate. I think it makes Cape Elizabeth a more livable area. Thank you. There's a number of other issues regarding the application that we need to get to, but that seems to be the hot topic of the moment. Well, if you want to continue with your issues. Well, I thought ready. maybe somebody else. Well, how about if I weigh in on the sidewalk issue okay, first? Um, I'd also like to reiterate that we are stuck with, and it's not always an easy task for us, um, interpreting the ordinance as it stands. Um, that being said, and I will also echo Mr. Charles' comment that no, the sidewalk won't go anywhere now, but eventually as the clothing store um, perhaps comes for review, that eventually may connect to the doctor's office sidewalk. Um, I also acknowledge that we do sometimes have some flexibility, and I would be supportive of not installing any further trees. Um, but I would also say that um, during the sidewalk, I 
don't think it was a popular notion, but I presented perhaps a compromise measure in taking a sentence out of the ordinance that reads, a sidewalk should be constructed parallel to the front facade. Um, my compromise measure that I proposed was perhaps the sidewalk is in front of the building, stops at the edge of the woods so that the trees don't need to be disturbed, the uh, rural feeling, the you know, vegetation doesn't need to be disturbed just to accommodate the sidewalk. Um, and I'd still like to present that as a possible compromise, but I think it's clear it's in the town center, and I do believe um, the ordinance requires a sidewalk. Thank you. If we're going to stay on the sidewalk issue, I'd like to make my comments at this time. Uh, I concur with uh, the other board members that we are here uh, as a board uh, to see that the conditions uh, in the ordinance are met by these projects. In addition, I feel uncomfortable uh, making a concession to some people and not to others. We've had uh, several projects since I've been on the board in the town center, and all of those uh, uh, projects have had to put a sidewalk in and meet the conditions of the town center ordinance, and I'd feel very uncomfortable uh, facing some of those other applicants, knowing that we conceded uh, something different to somebody else. So, from that standpoint, I feel it's my responsibility to uphold the ordinance uh, regarding the sidewalk. Just one quick comment, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I agree with Mr. Griffin's comment that sometimes I have to vote against my own common sense when it comes to honoring and enforcing local ordinances. Uh, I would like to address one comment that the town probably should have put a sidewalk in at this building as they owned it, uh, however they were not required to. I can tell you when I sat on this board a number of years ago and the middle school went through its $11 million renovation, I very reluctantly had to uphold the town ordinance at that time because as a taxpayer I would like to have seen that renovation come in at substantially less cost. But one of the things that was required by the town ordinance is that they had to put in a very lengthy sidewalk. And, uh, it's almost a half mile long, but it has added something to the town center. Uh, so the town has to, when even renovating its own properties, properties have to follow the same ordinances that I have to. And I'm obligated by law to uphold and support the ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chim. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Mr. Sh the, the other issue that I know we've discussed uh, before it is the issue of the septic system. Um, it, it's unclear to me whether there is new information beyond what we have, but the information I have indicates that the current septic system will not be sufficient for the phase two build out. And if I recall correctly, when we discussed this issue before um, that the, the way I believe the board was looking at it was that if if and when the phase two build out is begun the applicant would have to either show a sewer connection or a uh, modification or replacement of the septic system is there anything different tonight from that from that idea uh, in, my, in my introduction, I, I mentioned that we do have a septic system design, and as the discussion turns to that, if you would like that septic system presented, uh, we would be happy to give you the design. Well, maybe Maureen, you can help me on this. My understanding was we didn't need to go through the exercise of reviewing and approving a new design for the phase two septic system now, but that when, if and when the phase two came upon us, that system would have to be approved by the town engineer or they would have to show a sewer connection. Yeah, if, if the applicant wants to submit a septic system design right now and say, this is what we're going to do, I mean, certainly they can do that. Right. The proposal that was put forth in the memo was to leave that open to the applicant and they would only have to promise that prior to occupancy of phase two, they would have to do either a new septic system or a connection. And that could be attached as a condition of approval added to a note on the plan, and therefore the applicant leaves their options open. 
Yeah, because I, I, at this point, since we don't have anything in front of us and the town engineer hasn't seen it, I can't approve a, a design of a new system, nor do I think we have to, to get approval tonight. And so if that's acceptable, when the phase two comes, then, then the new design can be reviewed, which I assume it already has been by the town engineer or not. Well, I could clarify that a little bit. Um, after the, uh, uh, we have had uh, an HHE 200 prepared. Uh, the, uh, you know, at the direction uh, of the code enforcement officer, uh, we had uh, a professional septic system engineer uh, review the existing installation. And uh, the way, the way the, uh, the work is done and a report is written, uh, basically generating a replacement system design is almost part of that process. So we can assure the board at this time uh, that even though you may not want to take on reviewing it in 60 seconds, uh, that one has been prepared by a registered professional engineer, that it can work on that site. Uh, it's an infiltrator system that fills the back, about half of the backyard. Uh, with a mound two feet high. Uh, so it can be done. We can assure you that it can be done. In fact, it has been designed, uh, and it's something that is a viable alternative uh, for the phase two part of the project. Well, I, I mean, I'd, again, I'd be willing to go with what we had originally proposed, which is at the time the phase two modification comes along, they can submit their new septic system or sewer connection and it would be up to the town engineer at that point. I'm still opposed to a sidewalk. I think we have to be rational about ordinances, but if we decide, I seem to be the only one who's as opposed as I am. Um, I would like to at least consider Karen Lowell's recommendation Taking out the existing vegetation makes no sense at all. We're always talking about the rural character of this community. There are big trees in there. It's beautiful vegetation. It's all wild. I, I think we have to be somewhat rational. We have an abutting neighbor who's saying, look, they're going to have drainage problems. And then we're saying to the applicant, we'll solve those problems because we're making you take out the vegetation. I mean, I think we have to be rational about the ordinance. Not every situation can be rigidly defined by an ordinance. I think we have to work rationally. So I'm asking the rest of this committee to at least consider Karen Lowell's recommendation. I would do nothing personally. I would recommend nothing. But I'm willing to at least consider that to meet the ordinance because we made someone else put in the sidewalk. I uh, echo. Barbara's uh, sentiments on that particular proposal. I, I am interested in hearing from Mr. Wilcox or the applicant as to whether that type of proposal is something that uh, is feasible. Uh, because I heard earlier that there's just, just a sidewalk is not going to be built. It can't be built. We don't have the money for it. So I'd like to hear back from the applicant on that issue. Maybe we should define a little bit more, Karen, what, what it is you're proposing, that it go to a certain point? Well, I guess uh, I would propose starting it, um, you know, where the driveway is, and I don't know if that's east, west, north, or south of the property, and extending as far as the existing tree line um, towards moving in the direction towards the Rand's property and, you know, terminating in a sloping manner or something um, where the trees start. You know, as you're facing the building towards the left of the building. Well, I guess to put it in terms that the ordinance requires that it be along the front of the entire property and this, your proposal would not have it run the front of the entire property, but I think for purposes of the record, we should define where it would stop and, and how, so the applicant knows what we're what we're talking about. Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Chair, I have a couple of items that I think uh, uh, 
could further enter into the discussion at some point, at whatever point I could add them in. Bring them up, please. Um, uh, I'll come back to the sidewalk in just a second, but just to address uh, the issue of traffic report, I think uh, one thing that would be good to, to start out with is if we just had some clarification uh, about what was asked for in the memo. Uh, one part of the memo asks about, speaks about 100 trips per day. Another part of the memo speaks about 100 peak hour trips uh, from, the plan, from Maureen's memo. Uh, if we should have uh, some clarification on that, I'm sure it's something that could be uh, fairly easily resolved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, uh, under the site plan review standards, on the first page of the memorandum, uh, paragraph B1 mentions uh, more than 100 trips generated. Uh, but further back, page four. Uh, on page four at the bottom under page one, it says if the traffic generation exceeds 100 peak hour trips, uh, which obviously I, I think is probably a big a difference between the two, uh, and we could verify. Uh, the condition one on page four probably fairly quickly. Uh, furthermore, I'll wait for your attention on this one because this is important. Excuse, excuse when we us. came to workshop, one of the first things we said was we have a lower parking demand than is at the existing parking lot. Is the existing parking lot okay and should we do a traffic report? We left that meeting without the directive to do a traffic report. Uh, so I have no problem verifying this now. Uh, I think if it were just clarified, that would all it would be required. Uh, it's something that could have probably been taken care of uh, fairly easily before this, if it had been known that it was a desire of the board. Maybe Maureen can correct me, but Mark, my understanding is this, is, this isn't something that we put in a memo as something we wanted after we had had workshops and all that. This is part of the requirement for, for the application. And it's not a requirement that a traffic study, as we all know what that term means, be done. It's merely a requirement that you produce evidence that you don't exceed this uh, standard so that you don't have to do a further traffic study. Right. Well, the standard in the ordinance doesn't say 100 trips per hour or per day. It just says safe flow of traffic. Uh, and we're happy to work on clarifying what that might mean for this installation. If you want me to respond. Yes, please. please the, the problem is that the board is basically caught between a rock and a hard place. You're not allowed to review projects unless you have clear and concise standards. If your standards are too subjective, um, the courts have said that uh, vague standards, and I believe it's the Wakefield decision, are thrown out. And you know, the whole approval gets thrown back to the board. You've got to deal with it again. So there's this increasing pressure that standards have to be specific. If they're subjective, then um, you're, you're being vague and, and arbitrary and capricious. So when the ordinance was rewritten in 97, we tried to take the site plan standards and as much as possible put some specificity in them. What that does is it, it, it gives the applicant a lot of predictability on what they need to do, but it also restricts the, uh, the ability of the board to be flexible. Under the site plan approval standards, which are under section 19-9-5, the board, when it votes a motion for approval, has to affirmatively find that it meets each one of these standards. And there needs to be something in the record it shows that you, you based your, your decision on something. Um, under standard B, traffic access and parking, it specifically says vehicular access to the site will be on roads which have, it, which have adequate capacity to accommodate the additional traffic generated by the development. Specifically, four developments which generate 100 or more peak hour trips based on the latest edition of the trip generation manual of the Institute of Traffic Engineers intersections on major access routes to the site within one mile of any entrance road which are functioning at a level of service C or better prior to the development will function at a minimum of level of service C after development. So 
there's very little flexibility here for the board. It, it's, it's a standard for most projects in Cape Elizabeth that isn't a problem because we don't have projects large enough to generate this number of peak hour trips. But there's nothing in the record right now, either provided by the board or by the applicant, that allows you to even make that finding. So there's, there's really not a lot of flexibility for you. Uh, well, if it, if it is in fact peak hour trips, uh, if that is the standard, then I would like to offer for the board's consideration uh, that if there are a total of four employees, 30 patients over the course of a 10 hour day, uh, if you would like us to get a traffic engineer to say that doesn't constitute 100 peak hour trips, uh, you know, we'll be happy to do so. We'd just like some clarification on whether it can come from me or a stamped traffic engineer or what you would like. I'd like to suggest that I recommend the discussion, my recollection of the discussion at the workshop was that a medical office would not generate nearly the number of people coming in and out of that parking lot as a community center did. I remember that clearly that that was sad. And I certainly don't think we need a traffic report if there is a book that we need to find that says the average medical office of such and such a size generates 30 trips a day. I mean, we're not even talking about anything close to this standard. 100 trips for peak hours means there may be 400 people going out of a building during the course of a 10-hour day. I mean, at least that's what it says to me. Peak might be between 9 and 10 and 4 and 5. Mr. Chairman, I think this, I don't see this as a particular obstacle one way or the other. Uh, as Maureen so clearly stated, it is a requirement that we have to validate that particular uh, requirement of the site plan application process is met. But there's a, a clearly written condition in a proposed motion for us that says, um, the chip generation information be provided. It doesn't say where it has to come from. It just has to be in accordance with what's specified in the ordinance. I have no doubt that the, the planning staff will be glad to help you get that data. Um, and I don't know. If a, if a single family residence is 10, then I don't know what this would be. But it should be very easy to get the numbers. And all it's asking is if it generates more than what would cause a degradation of service at that intersection, that some study be done. <coughs> Excuse me, that some study be done. Sounds like it's not going to do anything to degrade the, the traffic at the town center, so just put the numbers on paper and we're all set. I'm ready to vote for that particular finding with this condition in place. Uh, I'd like to further address the sidewalk issue with some more information uh, at any rate, which probably should be considered by the board uh, in, uh, in addressing this. Uh, I'm uh, sure that this is also, uh, to an applicant, this is a vague situation similar to the one Maureen just mentioned about vague standards being thrown out. Uh, you know, if, a, if there should be a sidewalk in front of a house, uh, it's obviously not something that's quantified uh, in terms of uh, what type of site plan uh, is being presented to the board, whether it's a new building, whether it's a renovation, uh, whether it's replacing the windows in the house, which causes uh, site plan review, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, there are there are always conflicting uh, standards. Uh, that's part of uh, part of the task of resolving an application and making a judgment uh, in, for any judicial body. Uh, it's no surprise there are always conflicting laws and regulations that come into play. And especially on a renovation project where uh, it, uh, there's a degree of interpretation and uh, judgment of reason as to whether or not one, uh, for instance, rips down the house and puts the parking lot beside the house uh, like the diagram shows in the town center uh, design standards. Uh, you know, there is always uh, an element of interpretation and, uh, and a judgment of what is reasonable. Uh, we have uh, presented uh, some of what, what we feel are the contradictory standards uh, that would come into play uh, in the design of a sidewalk. And, and there are a few more. Uh, 
during the site walk, one of the things that we pointed out, and, and perhaps all of you didn't notice this because we were kind of broken up, uh, but the proper design of a sidewalk, and I'm not a civil engineer, uh, but the proper design of a sidewalk would not allow the water from the road to wash over it. Uh, the sidewalk would be raised up slightly so that that water doesn't ru run over the sidewalk and create a hazard uh, on the sidewalk. <coughs> uh, that, uh, in the, and what, uh, we, what Craig referred to uh, was, was sort of recapping that, uh, was that right now, uh, the grass on the front lawn does sort of take some of the water coming off of, off of the road from the crown of the road across this part of the front lawn. And there's a sort of a little, there's like a drainage swale dip in the lawn uh, on Dr. Johnson's property that accommodates uh, that road runoff. Uh, it directs it down to a low area right in here. Uh, more of it comes in right here also. Uh, Ponding referred to uh, in the letter from the abutter uh, happens further, further down right here. And in the course of constructing a, uh, a sidewalk, and this was something that was sort of done as a visual, kind of waving hands around <laughs> on the sidewalk, uh, raising the sidewalk six inches above the level of the road and maintaining the uh, road slope uh, does a couple of things. Uh, first, it produces a sidewalk that uh, would have uh, about a six and a half to seven percent slope. Uh, it would also create uh, what you would, uh, sort of a drainage channel because the sidewalk would be higher than the road. It would create a drainage channel and none of that water that currently comes across the front lawn into the wooded area now would be allowed to do that. Uh, it would continue down the street and it would find the nearest place in front of the abutters land uh, where it would then seek to pond. There is currently a small pond down there now in a rainstorm, after a rainstorm, even a day after a rainstorm, uh, that's at the foot of their driveway. That pond uh, would get larger. I can't quantify how much larger, uh, but it would be unreasonable to expect it to not get larger. Furthermore, I think one of the things that the board uh, should look at uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the realm of conflicting standards that come to bear on an individual, uh, I'm not sure, and I would look to the town to, direct, to uh, mention this, uh, that right now there is enough room between the edge of the travel lane and the property line to barely accommodate five feet of grass and a five foot sidewalk. Uh, the standards do not require curbing. Uh, all there would be there would be a grass strip five feet wide uh, and then the sidewalk. Uh, I think you would then look in terms of, you should then think of what is a proper sidewalk design. What, what would a proper sidewalk design be? In a, in a rural area, quite commonly, uh, you might find a shoulder on the side of a road. There is no shoulder on this road. Shore Road is very tight and narrow. You might find a drainage ditch, which accommodates some of the drainage concerns that I just mentioned and, and provides for them. Uh, if you put a drainage ditch there, there would be no room to put a sidewalk there. It would take up the whole 10 feet of width. If you put a proper shoulder in there, that would take up most of the 10 feet of width. Uh, there, uh, so what, what ends up happening is, is that the board is in a place uh, where it's looking at uh, what can't reasonably done under one applicant under one applicant's effort. Uh, you can look, you have new sidewalks to look at. Uh, there were just several hundred feet of them done at town center. They include a space between the white line of the travel lane and a curb, a curb which channels water to a piped drainage system, which prevents the water from becoming a nuisance to neighbors. 
uh, you can see the example uh, of what can be done right and correctly according to proper design standards uh, when more than one property is affected. Uh, this is commonly acknowledged to be a role of government and not an individual. And directing an unsafe alternative to this applicant, I think, is something that should be taken into consideration, that the town should take responsibility for whatever might happen uh, as a result of the acts of this board. Uh, the white painted line is literally right adjacent to where the grass starts here. And if you had the town engineer come into this section of, of Shore Road, uh, you would probably find out what a proper design is. And there's probably a very good reason why it hasn't been done before. And there's a good reason why all of Shore Road has not achieved proper traffic design. It's a narrow road with obstacles to proper safe development. Uh, at the uh, very least, uh, the right-of-way would need to be widened or realigned in order to make room for proper pedestrian, shoulder, and drainage accommodations. Uh, so there is a well-intentioned uh, suggestion in the town center ordinance which suggests that there be sidewalks, uh, but there is a, there's a substantial difference between that desire and, and the reality of how to make a proper sidewalk. And it doesn't seem fair nor reasonable given the fact that it is a vague standard and not addressed specifically to the degree of renovation or the size of project that requires it to impose it uh, on one individual applicant. Uh, that being said, uh, if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to address those. Mr. Charles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would point out that there's a, another property literally across the street from this one, uh, also owned by an applicant named Johnson that has the same closeness of the road to the, to the property and the sidewalk to be installed there, the plans that I saw. Uh, it was creatively done. It wound around some large trees so that they weren't affected by the installation. I'd like to, to uh, do something I'm a little uncomfortable with. My, my interpretation of the ordinance is that it, it says a sidewalk should be installed across the front of the property. But given the, the specific nature of this application, I think we could look at uh, what, what Karen suggested, which would be to require the sidewalk only across a certain portion of this property. And if you look at the, the drawing that was submitted to us with tonight's application package, uh, if you take the easternmost edge of the building and go, I think the suggestion was 10 feet beyond that, that barely encroaches on the wooded area. So it, if we'd used 10 feet beyond the easternmost edge of the building as the, the eastern boundary of the sidewalk and the western boundary would be the western edge of the property, then a sidewalk would be installed pretty much across the grass and just a few feet into the woods, but a, a very few feet. Um, I would be willing to vote in favor of an amendment to our proposed motion that took it only that far and no further. Are you talking about 10 feet beyond? the building as depicted in phase one? Yeah, as 10 feet beyond the furthest uh, development of building of structures on the property. That would be um, phase two. The shady, air, the shady, air, shady area. Phase one goes this far east. Oh, okay. Phase I'm two sorry. adds some northern. I'm, I'm sorry. So the side, I'm saying it would be right. approximately there. Okay. Go back to here. Mm -hmm. Are you, uh, well, can you, can you pick that on your plan also? Um, I, I think I have the, yeah, okay. general idea. It would be, it would be to the extent of the first plan that's L1. Mm -hmm. If you drew a line perpendicular to the street from the end of that construction and go 10 feet further towards a tree. Yeah. I'm still against the sidewalk, but if it 
the only way this project's going to get approved. Um, why can't we stop at the tree line, period? Why make them take any trees out at all? Now, the, why not just say to the tree line? That, that's where that approximate 10 feet goes. Well, from. we're not sure about that. So if we just you said to the tree line, then that would be clear, I think. Okay. The bush line, the tree line, the vegetation line, whatever it's, you call it. It's not, that would not require the removal of any significant trees. There may be a few scrubby bushes that fall over that 10-foot line, but you have, to, you have to pick a fresh. boundary that, that's defined. And if we say just to the tree line and, no, and those bushes aren't trimmed for a couple of years, then all of a sudden the tree line moved 10 feet. Well, so the intention, is to, the intention is to go the full extent of all buildings on the property, plus a few feet, just to make it complete. That's a suggestion for the board to consider anyway. Again, I'm referring probably out of context and, uh, and in isolation, um, but that the town center design standards require that a sidewalk be constructed parallel to the front facade of the building. So I guess I would be content not even to have it extend a few feet past, um, you know, not even do the 10 feet. I'd have it, you know, assuming that goes approximately to the tree line. Um, I don't see a reasonable reason to request the extra 10 feet. What that might do is stop it part up to the grass. Okay. So if we're not going to go the entire length of the property, I, I think I'd actually prefer that it stop part way through the grass because then you can actually get onto it from the street by crossing over grass rather than cutting through trees. It just seems odd to me to go into a grove of trees and end. I think I'd almost rather it end on the, the lawn. And I've actually I think I've seen sidewalks like that in other places. One thing we don't know is how accurate the, the vegetation the line is. Mark the drawing. Yeah. We can presume the building's pretty accurately depicted. On on L1, the placement on our drawing of the major tree that the sidewalk would run into, is that an accurate placement on our drawing? On L1. And that drawing is traced from the survey that the town had done prior to construction of the community center, and it appears to be accurate. Uh, some of these trees, however, and I'm not sure which one, uh, they're not exactly fine specimens, but they there, are there. There is a fairly large one right there, I believe. Bill. Would you be more comfortable if it went just to the end of the structure of the building? I'm fine with that. If the line was drawn perpendicular to the street? I'd just as soon not have it. But. <laughs> I'm comfortable with that. Uh, are there any other issues? Uh, that need to be discussed. Uh, just before anybody makes a motion, is, uh, would it be appropriate, Maureen, if we indicated in part two of the motion, just for purposes of checking up on this after construction, 
that the five foot wide sidewalk be constructed along the frontage of the lot along, uh, I, I basically I want to reflect that it's the length of the building as depicted in phase one from the driveway, from the driveway to the edge of the, what, what direction are we going in? Uh, eastern, the eastern edge of the building is de depicted in uh, phase uh, one of the plan. not have any sidewalk installed in this section. I mean, do it at the podium, please. I'm sorry. Oh, at the podium. Or, or at the. Uh, in order, in order to address the uh, water flow uh, traffic being right near the edge of the pavement and safety concerns. Uh, one of the things that the applicant would like to propose is to uh, develop further the idea of a partial approach to putting a sidewalk on the street. Uh, in, in, continue, in sort of addressing the concept of the purpose of a sidewalk, is to link the property up uh, to the town center. Uh, a design modification uh, which could be made uh, that we would like to propose uh, and then we'll pick up the pen on this right now. This is the first. Uh, that the applicant construct a sidewalk uh, from the false front door of the building and a sidewalk at that location would perhaps make it look more like a front door, even though everybody would know uh, that it is not really the front door of the building. And that would continue down to the right of way, uh, sort of in this area right in here. That would be a uh, four foot wide, two minutes concrete sidewalk, uh, which would then link up with a five foot wide sidewalk set five feet back from the street. Uh, but this sidewalk, however, would find its terminus at that location. Uh, and that this sidewalk at the front door to this building would then be the, the terminus of what looks like the town center sidewalk system. And this would then start to link up uh, to the rest of town center in this area right here. Uh, but then also uh, sort of scoot down the street to allow uh, people to get back on the street uh, to continue walking if they're walking in that direction. The, the, there are two uh, advantages uh, to this approach. Uh, one is it highlights the uh, front door of the building, even though it's not actually used, and, and makes the house uh, still continue to look like a house. I mean, it doesn't have a sidewalk now, but a 
and one of the emphases that we've been trying to accomplish uh, in the project is to keep it looking like a house, even though it's turning into a doctor's office. Uh, it would allow that sort of focus on the house-like quality of the front door of the facility. Uh, it would also uh, not impede with the water flow uh, right now beyond, and it would impede a little bit, but any water, and most of the water is coming down in this area, right in through here now, and it would not impede that. Uh, it would be the steepest section of the, of the sidewalk, it would, uh, uh, but it would then uh, sort of achieve those two goals uh, if it's something uh, I'd like to sort of offer it uh, as an amendment as to the plan at this point in time if, if that can be dealt with. Thank you. Any discussions on that proposal? Well, I guess I would say, I, I think, given the fact, and I'll, I'll take this on, on faith that this is the last property in the town center district, it's not. Next to last, I believe. It's the, if I recall from our site walk, that the next residence over was actually part of the town center district, although it appeared that might have been included inadvertently. inadvertently. Well, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> yeah, I, again, if, if it in fact is the last property, and I would tend to agree with you that the other property was included inadvertently since it's a, a residence. Um, then that type of design for the sidewalk obviously can fill the need, whereas if it was a property in between two properties in the town center district, it wouldn't. Uh, what, frankly, Mr. Wilcox, what I would have preferred is that you had come to the board, obviously you were opposed to building the sidewalk, but if you had had a proposal knowing that sidewalk was required and it was it was very possible that we would hold you to that requirement then we wouldn't have to be drawing pen lines on the on the plan and then trying to make that into something that the code enforcement officer has to enforce it would make it would have made it a lot easier for, for us um, the the concept i think works where it's the last property in the town center district now how we can address that with enough specificity so that everybody knows what it means is another question uh, I can I can address both of those issues uh, first of all I'll speak it again for the record that the ordinance says should it does not say shall it indicates a desire but not an imperative tense uh, if you read words very carefully uh, that is very apparent, so I would disagree that it's required, and we knew it was required from the start. And uh, furthermore, I think in order to uh, avoid some of these uh, difficulties of the timing and the implementation of the design, uh, we would offer this to be implemented on the phase two site plan, not the phase one site plan. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I feel very strongly that if we're to require a sidewalk, it should be part of, it shouldn't be grandfathered to some future date, but it should be part of any initial phase of construction. Um, and then I would, I would point out that as we look at these issues, it's not just a single word in the ordinance, it's also the, uh, our best interpretation of the, tent, the intent of both the council and the citizen committee that came up with this plan, which very clearly stated that sidewalk should be installed throughout the town center district. Um, and we also, I think, were pretty clear at the site walk that the majority of the board thought a sidewalk should be installed. So I, I agree with Mr. Seraldo. It's pretty hard to, to evaluate uh, a set of line scribbles on the drawing when, when a, a fully fleshed out plan that's been reviewed by town staff would be a whole lot better information for us to vote upon. Having said that, I think that's probably a reasonable compromise were it to be turned into something that was 
truly a part of the plan and, and not just a hand drawing, in my view. I, I concur. I, I like that concept that's been drawn on the uh, plan up there on the bulletin board more than the idea of having the sidewalk and midstream in the lot. I think it serves a lot of the intents here to, to join up the entrance and make it part of a network. So I would be in favor of that proposal. I'm just wondering how we can get out of here tonight uh, with some type of approval for this project, given the lack of specificity with the drawing. And I'm wondering if perhaps the town planner could give us any guidance on, on that. Oh, or any of the members of, of the uh, planning board. Um, I, I missed part of the discussion, but I take it that that would be the sidewalk. That would be, if that's, if that meets everybody's conditions, I think we can just make a condition that the sidewalk be put in um, and sort of describe it as best we can, subject to the approval of the town planner or the code enforcement officer or the correct person. They can put it on the plan, but we make it subject to them putting it on the plan and approved. Not to have to come back before us again, but as a condition. We visited this issue before. We can't delegate approval of plans to town staff. We can only uh, recommend confirmation of plans that have been prepared and reviewed prior to our meeting. And that was precisely my concern. And um, this seems to be a more definitive condition than we've dealt with in the past, where most of us were reluctant to approve a site plan. Uh, I'm just wondering if anything comparable has occurred before, Maureen. Well, if, if the applicant's willing to leave that drawing here, you can just say you basically approve that drawing subject to the submission of construction drawings that accurately reflect that. And if the applicant brings back construction drawings that I think are dramatically different than that, we'll just bring it back to another board meeting. I guess I'd be all right with that if he could um, make some notation on what he's going to leave with you in terms of the construction materials and width. Um. And preservation of trees. Mm -hmm. um, what, ab what about the uh, material that the sidewalks are made out? Do they have to be the same material that we use in the rest of the town center? There's nothing in the ordinance that specifies what the surface treatment okay. has to be. So bituminous is an acceptable alternative. For the, for the record, what did uh, Everett Johnson end up on his drawing? Okay. There is a there is a specification for a bituminous walk on the plan that I gather goes elsewhere or is on another part of the property. Is that something that we can there is, a, there is an existing walkway, as I have seen, when I did the site walk that goes down beside the building on the, on the access to the back of the town hall parking lot. Well, Mark, the, on the L1, the bituminous walk diagram there, where is that? On the uh, right now, that bituminous walk is this little guy right here. Okay. How wide, how wide is that? And that is, uh, I believe, four feet wide also. Uh, in, in this process, uh, would the town engineer be able to have a chance to look at this also? Look at the uh, this this sidewalk. This bituminous sidewalk is built uh, to a higher than normal standard of walkway. It is not built to the standard of what's in the subdivision ordinance, however. Okay. So you're saying you would so, rather not? Which I would not recommend uh, excavating for 18 inches of gravel under a sidewalk uh, right next to a significant tree, especially. Uh, it's probably 
way over here. Okay, so you would rather not use that sidewalk? I would, I would prefer to use the sidewalk design that we have here. Not, that's, not shown, that's shown on the plan? Yes. I raise that only because it's something specific that we can point to uh, so that the code enforcement officer knows what, what everybody's trying to get at. I would like to just go on record that one of the things that pleases me as a citizen in this town is the walkway that is now existing in the center of town with the esplanade. Uh, you, no matter what time you drive through town now, you see people on the sidewalks. It also, as a resident since 1973, it's kind of nice to have the feeling that we have a town center now. And it's now starting to take shape. And it's only been in the last few years that this has happened. And I think it if nothing else in the Cape Elizabeth, uh, there's a lot of things that we like, but I think a town center has been needed and uh, it's starting to take shape. And I think this is another indication that having a sidewalk along this piece of property certainly would go along helping this center of town continue to prosper as a center. Are we ready for a motion? Well just at the risk of dragging this out even longer than we already have. I, I guess where I am, just so everybody is on board and if the applicant understands, if we can use the, the hand-drawn diagram as a guide and then refer to the type of walkway that's on the, the plan, um, would, would we need anything further to give the code enforcement enforcement officer something to go by in terms of what we've approved. Well, I think that we have an ordinance on this, the design of the sidewalk, resident sidewalk, and I think if I understood Mark, he would prefer to comply with that rather than the standard that he has in front of his garage, and it would be acceptable to me if if uh, they adhered to the standard that we have for standard side, sidewalks. Okay, maybe I guess I heard the opposite. So, Mark, can you, at the risk of answering the same question again, you're saying then you would prefer not to use the design that's... I would prefer to use the design that's in the plans right now. Okay, that's what I thought. Rather than the, the, than the town standard? The subdivision standard, which is used in building new neighborhoods, uh, even for a sidewalk, for a sidewalk requires, I believe, it's 16 or 18 inches of, of gravel, and for a road, uh, even more than that. Uh, in an existing situation, in particular, that's uh, where the where the uh, underlying earth has had years to settle down and compact. Uh, that's not simply not necessary. Okay, I I'm sorry, I misunderstood you earlier. Uh, in an existing condition where we're not. Uh, raising large lifts of fill, which is what we have here. Uh, you know, the underlying soil, just from rain and age, is, is more compacted. It's not a man-made lift with a sidewalk on top of it. So 18 inches of compacted gravel uh, well, would not only be overkill, but would in, in, invariably start digging down into the tree roots uh, more than it would be necessary in that area. Well, so based on that, I, I, for one, would would be satisfied with the the walkway design that's included on the plan, and that, together with the hand drawn diagram, I think would give both the applicant and staff enough specificity so everybody knows what what needs to be done. Can we? Uh... And how we say that in a motion, I, I don't know. But. We've got something percolating here that hopefully okay. we'll get close to that. So. Would, There's a good chance that it will not be handicapped accessible without extensive work. 
There, I said it. That's all. No, but they can clear off the. I don't know that that's necessary. I mean, the building's handicap accessible, so. Okay. <coughs> this is uh, design on the fly, so I'm offering this for comment both from the board and from the applicant. I believe the applicant has a copy of our memorandum for this project. In that memorandum is a proposed motion, and what I'm about to read would be um, item two of the motion, replacing what you have with the following words, that a sidewalk be constructed from the entrance drive to the building door facing shore road, located to minimize impact on existing trees and conforming substantially to the hand sketch submitted at the September 17, 2002 planning board meeting. Plans for the sidewalk shall be submitted and reviewed by town staff prior to the issuance of a building permit. Construction detail for the sidewalk shall take into consideration preservation of adjacent trees. Period. So what that's intended to say is we would vote for what you sketched up there, presuming that a real plan be created and the town staff, including the town engineer, be given a chance to review it, where their charter would be if there are any issues, um, that they would work with you on resolving those issues. And if there's no resolution, then it may have to come back to the board, but we're trying very hard not to force that upon you or ourselves, for that matter. Any comments? Shall we proceed with the motion, then? I suggest, Mr. Charles, you read the entire motion. <laughs> I was going to offer that for you, Peter. <laughs> I don't know. The one to table is a lot shorter. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer the following motion. Findings of fact. One, Dr. Craig Johnson, also doing business as Foxtrot Properties, LLC, is requesting site plan review to convert the existing building located at 1226 Shore Road to the Cape Health Center, a medical office with two proposed additions and a new two-car garage, which requires review under Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations and Section 19-6-4D3 Town Center Design Requirements. Two, no information has been submitted, has been provided, estimating chip generation at full build-out. Three, the town center design standards require that a sidewalk be constructed parallel to the front facade of the building. Four, the code enforcement officer has determined that the existing septic system may fail as part of the phase one construction and will not meet the plumbing code for phase two construction. Five, the preservation of existing vegetation will provide a continuous buffer to the residential property to the east. And six, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-6-4D3 town center design requirements. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dr. Craig Johnson, also doing business as Foxtrot Properties LLC for site plan review to convert the existing building located at 1226 Shore Road to the Cape Health Center, a medical office with two proposed additions and a new two-car garage, be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that trip generation information for the full build-out of the medical office building be provided. If the traffic generation exceeds 100 peak hour trips, the applicant shall submit an analysis of the Shore Road, Route 77, Scott Dyer Road intersection that demonstrates that the proposed development will not reduce the current level of service of the intersection. If the level of service is reduced, the applicant shall return to the planning board for review of the traffic analysis. All information shall be submitted to the, to the town planner for review. Two, that a sidewalk be constructed from the entrance drive to the building door facing Shore Road located to minimize impact on existing trees and conforming substantially to the hand sketch submitted at the September 17, 2002 planning board meeting. Plans for this sidewalk shall be submitted and reviewed by town staff prior to the issuance of a building permit. Construction detail for the sidewalk shall take into consideration preservation of adjacent trees. Three, that the project shall be connected to the public sewer system or a replacement septic system be designed and installed prior to the construction of phase two. The septic system design shall be in accordance with the plumbing code as determined by the code enforcement officer. Four, that a continuous limit of clearing line be established on the plans to preserve a continuous vegetated buffer on the eastern side of the property. And five, finally, that there be no issuance of a building permit for the construction of phase one or two until the plans and materials have been revised to address the above conditions and submitted to the town planner for review, who will distribute to other town staff as appropriate. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion?
Hearing no discussion, I will raise it to a vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Wilcox. Yes, you may. Uh, since there wasn't discussion after the motion, uh, a few minutes ago, I, I just raised the possible issue of this sidewalk being part of the phase two construction uh, as envisioned by the applicant. Uh, that wasn't uh, part of the motion. And I would like to offer uh, a couple reasons uh, why uh, there's a certain amount of logic to this. Uh, currently, uh, the site work uh, in Vermont, uh, is largely just in, in this area over here on this side of the building. Uh, part of the uh, condition number three uh, involves connecting to the sewer, which as part of phase two, which would be done. Uh, that, law, that work would also start to impact the front lawn the front lawn of this building because the sewer pipe would, would come out this way and go up Shore Road. Uh, given the, uh, the more reduced scope of work contemplated in Phase 1 uh, and the, both the increased scope in Phase 2 and the, the nature of the scope of connecting to the sewer, which is the preferred, preferred route that the applicant would take, uh, it makes uh, a good amount of sense to have uh, these two operations tied into the larger expanded facility uh, on the phase two site. Uh, we would request discussion on that uh, and submit that to you. I would like to make a quick comment. I think that uh, from my standpoint, um, a sidewalk uh, through, the, through the front of the property was uh, would have met the standards of the town ordinance. Um, but I feel that any, cons my feeling is that uh, there has been a concession made and I would be very uncomfortable if this wasn't done uh, when phase, when the project was started in the initial time, not waiting till phase two was to start to do the sidewalk. So that's my feeling on it. I think we've been more than, um, We've made quite a concession tonight to help them get this project. We've worked hard to get it going, and I'd really not like to delay it any further. I guess in looking beyond just this particular project, I would hate to establish a precedent where we, where something, we find something is required by the ordinance, and if it's tied to a future phase, which may or may not, be built. I know there's every intention to do it, but we've then basically taken out our requirement uh, based on a condition of whether further construction or a further phase is done, and that could create havoc in, in future projects, and I think it would be a problem. Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, I believe this, this application was given uh, due consideration, and a, consider a considerable number of concessions have been made. Uh, we voted in my mind, the matter is closed, and I would just uh, expect that this applicant would be held to the same standards as anyone else who has plans reviewed. There is a certain amount of time provided to to install the improvements that are shown on a site plan, and I would expect no more or less consideration for this particular project. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Then I think at this point uh, we should move on to the next uh, section on new business. Uh, the next project uh, for, for us tonight is the Flocatulus Private Access Way Permit. Costas and Lisa Flocatolis are requesting a private access way permit to create a second lot located at 142 Mitchell Road 
the application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-7-9 private access way standards. Good, lead, good late evening. <laughs> Mitchell and Associates, and we're representing Mr. and Mrs. Flockatoulos on this application. Uh, essentially, uh, as we did during the workshop session, the parcel uh, is located at 142 Mitchell Road. Uh, it is. Let her move right here. It's an existing uh, 45,953 square foot lot. It is surrounded on three sides by the property that is presently before this board for the Blueberry Ridge subdivision. Uh, what the Flocka Tools is looking to do is to construct a private access way in along this side of the property and develop this portion of the open uh, lawn area uh, for a second lot. This is the proposed concept where we'd be bringing the private access way in along this side. There's an existing circular driveway that services the existing house, which would be realigning to get that drive in far enough so that it doesn't become a uh, sight line or a traffic conflict issue as you come into the property. The roadway would come in. We have shown the uh, emergency turnaround. Uh, we had asked uh, for a waiver with the fire chief to reduce that down to a 14 foot uh, wide travel lane with two foot gravel shoulders on either side. Uh, otherwise, uh, we meet the other requirements as far as the overall length in both directions of 40 feet with a 20 foot uh, turning radius. The project will be served by public sewer, public water, and overhead utilities, and existing utilities will be, the proposed utilities will be taken from an existing overhead location here and run underground to serve the proposed residents. Uh, the building window is established by the 20-foot uh, side, front and rear setback requirements on this. We have shown a sample footprint based on some discussions we had with Maureen just to give the board an idea of what a potential home may be on that site, as well as to be able to provide uh, some delineation for that uh, emergency uh, turnaround area. There were initial comments that we received from staff uh, with some items that were outstanding on this. Uh, one was a location of a fire hydrant, and that had just been omitted from the plan initially. And there's a hydrant existing here. The uh, town engineer had a couple of review comments in terms of the turning radius at the entrance on a Mitchell Road. Uh, we had shown 15. They uh, have been changed to 20 feet. And the pavement area along the front of the property coming in will be a minimum of 50 feet from the edge of the existing roadway had it been shown from the property line. Uh, the applicant at this point isn't 100% sure whether they will pave the entire uh, portion of the roadway. It likely will be, but uh, we're just, in terms of meeting the intent of the ordinance, we're showing that we'll pave the first 50 feet. Uh, a couple of the other issues were detail oriented that the town engineer had in terms of providing a sewer cleanup and a sewer connection to the public sewer. We have added that to the plans which will be resubmitted uh, to respond to that. The uh, issue of drainage across the entrance of the driveway is an existing swale right now that runs down along the right of way to a culvert that exists here that runs under the adjacent driveway goes further on down to a culvert that crosses underneath Mitchell Road. Uh, I spoke with Mr. Harding regarding that, and what we need to try and do is look at what is being proposed by Blueberry Ridge and handling some of their storm drainage that's running down there to see what sort of issues may be of a conflict if that project goes forward. Uh, Steve's concern was whether or not we need to look at possibly putting a, a culvert under the driveway to address what uh, transpires from Blueberry Ridge. And I spoke with Steve about that this morning, so we're looking at the, uh, the Blueberry Ridge plans to address that drainage factor. Um, the issue of the certified boundary survey uh, that is presently being reviewed by uh, 
Owen Haskell and they will be signing off on that. They just needed to reconfirm the actual sizes of the two lots being created. And that was being done today. Unfortunately, I could not get that stamped today. So I will be submitting that afterwards. That's pretty much an overview of what's being proposed. If you have any questions, I can respond to those. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think the first order of business is to determine whether this application is complete. Would you like to get on through the list? I had one question, a uh, quick question, if I may. Did you address the town engineer's comment about buffering? No, that I did not. It was one that was suggested by the, the town engineer. The applicants, uh, at this point, not knowing whether they're going to build on that lot themselves, would rather defer to doing any landscaping at a later date rather than putting something in as far as a condition, uh, as far as a planting plan at this point. There are some existing uh, hemp, uh, spruce that are along this side in here that are probably anywhere from four to five or six feet tall that will be transplanted as a result of the, the private access way going in. And they may entertain looking at putting them in there, but part of the concern with that is when the ultimate height they get to is shading that rear property. But at this point, they prefer not to go into doing it. But it's not a completeness issue. I just wanted to make sure I hadn't missed something. Sure. Thank you. I, I just want to make sure I understood the presentation. I take it then the four issues that were raised in the memo relating to completeness have, have all been addressed or about to be addressed. Is that correct? We've revised the plan to address those items. I have not resubmitted another package of Maureen with that. Uh, the only item is the clarification of the certification by the surveyor. And that's what's coming. Well, given the fact that I assume we can address the issue of the drainage uh, at the time of the application, uh, it appears to be complete. I concur with that, and I have a motion unless there's more discussion. Right ahead. Uh, motion for the board to consider, to consider, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Custis and Lisa Blacatulis, I for a private access way permit to create a second lot located at 142 Mitchell Road, U34-18, be deemed complete. There's a motion in front of, do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, she'll be raising the right hand. The completeness is complete, sir. Uh, at this point, um, If you'd like to begin reviewing the application, uh, one of the issues that we need to discuss is whether we need a site walk or a hearing regarding this project. And my first question is to Maureen. Is, have you received any correspondence relative to this? I haven't received any correspondence. I've heard from one person who said they might potentially want to speak at a public hearing, but they're not sure. Okay. It hasn't been my impression that there's anything particularly urgent related to this application that a public hearing wouldn't set you back, or am I incorrect? Well, I don't know that you have a problem with waiting for a public hearing. You have to come back anyway. Yeah. Have another yeah. yeah, we can do it all in one night anyways. Yeah, yeah I, obviously we still need information to be able to act right. on the application, so it's really just a question of whether we also have a public hearing at the same time. Uh, Given, uh, I don't know if geography makes a difference, but since it's close to another project, which obviously has had a lot of interest, uh, we probably should have a public hearing. And if nobody comes, then it'll go quick. Right. And, and we can do it all on the same night. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. Just motion. A, make a motion? A couple things. Oh, sorry. Uh, when it comes time for review of final plans, I think it would be helpful to have uh, some determination in the plans what you're intending to do with buffering sure. along that, uh, particularly along the western property line. Also, uh, given that it sounds like some of your stormwater management may be predicated on what an adjacent subdivision is doing, 
and that subdivision is not yet approved, it would be good for you to have in your back pocket a plan that we can look at and approve whether or not Blueberry Ridge is done or not. And that's what I intend to do. I'm talking with Steve. We're talking about just the improvement. Is not that's approved or not? What sort of impact would be looking at right. the driveway crossing? So. Right. I mean, it, it sounds it, it would appear based on the planning board future schedules that Blueberry Ridge will Blueberry Ridge will be concluded one way or the other within a couple of months. I just hate right. for you to get caught up in any kind of delays there. No, we intend to address that. It's just that Steve and I, as I said, talking about the details. He wasn't 100 percent sure how that yeah. was going to resolve. So we will take a look at that. Well, I would agree that a public hearing should be held. Bob, I had a couple of questions uh, regarding uh, the suggestion that you name that as a road. Is, it, is, is that acceptable to your client? Yes. Okay. It would be called Delphi Road. I, met, I sent off a couple of uh, road names to Chief Williams, and then he got back with me this morning. And I did Delphi Way, and he asked if it would be road or street. Yeah. Selected road is the, uh, the second part of the. the okay. okay. Another motion for the board to consider, be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular October 15, 2002 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. So here is second. Motion's made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion, please show by raising the right hand. Motion carries. Thank you. I assume that means there's no sidewalk as well. I don't see any reason. We've been all around you that. Ask that. We've been around that <laughs> that property four times already. We have to come Probably know it very well. But. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. item on our agenda is the golf, cat, uh, golf course zoning amendment. Cape Elizabeth Town Council has referred back to the planning board proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance that would potentially make a golf course a permitted use in RA and RB districts and add a definition of golf course. Two options have been prepared by the planning board for consideration at a public hearing schedule for this evening. The zoning amendment will be considered in accordance with the procedures described in section 19-10-3 amendments. Um, perhaps we should summarize the proposed amendments at this point. So I will begin it. Maybe Maureen would like to add a few comments, but at our September workshop, the planning board requested that two golf course zoning amendments be drafted, which are attached as option one, which would make existing and new golf courses a permitted use in RA and RB district. Option two would make only existing golf course a permitted use in RA district only. Both options include the same definition of golf course. And I will note that, uh, that I think the options are um, defined further on for everybody here, as you recall. Do you have any further comments relative to the? Not unless the board has questions. Chairman, I so, believe we have a public hearing scheduled. I'd be interested right. to, to know what sort of commentary okay. we might receive. I just thought if there was any further comment, then we would open. As per plan, I open the public hearing. If there is anybody in the audience that would like to address this issue, please uh, step to the podium, identify themselves, and... Uh, Good evening. Uh, I'm Ken Keller. I live... 291 Spurwink Avenue, which is a butter for the Great Cape across from the 18th Fairway. We occasionally get golf balls in our front yard. 
So that says where we are. <clears throat> Obviously, we would prefer the option B, uh, which of course restricts the golf course to basically where it is or recognizes that it's been there for a long time and probably is what 99 out of 100 people who know anything at all about this thing think that that was what everything was to be done in the first place because you know, find out that the golf course isn't a permitted use, let's make it a permitted use and next item on the agenda. But somewhere along the line we got into this business of expanding the golf course across the street into RB, a 30-acre piece of property, and then, I don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden we've got RA and RB all the way through the town, which is 57% of the town or something like that. And uh, that's a, an entirely different breed of cat because <clears throat> uh, I can see the amount of discussion that went into whether this, this sidewalk was made 18 inch deep, something or other, or it was just kind of a, you know, a tar thing, you know, just sort of, at least we have something we can call the sidewalk. Uh, this is one of the most profound things that's probably come before this, this group in a long time. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, if you're going to do this, which I think you should think about, uh, your definition of a golf course is as loose as it possibly could be. And I'm afraid it probably includes miniature golf courses. Somebody could put up a miniature golf course along the road, floodlights at night, and a hot dog stand. And it would be a permitted use the way this is, is done. There are definitions of golf courses. Uh, you could go to the PGA or something like this. Uh, a regulation golf course looks like Perputic. But the way this is defined, if you want to do it this way, the way you defined it, at least three holes, they can be 50 feet apiece. You can have a pitch and putt. You could have almost anything. You could have floodlights at night. You could have music all night, for that matter. Uh, you could do almost anything you want. Now, the obvious thing for this particular piece of property is put a nine-hole golf course on it, which, of all the things that they could possibly do to it, as an abutter, the least obnoxious to us would be a nine-hole golf course, the real thing. Because, you know, a lot of people like to live on golf courses or right off the edges of them. But a parking lot, our driveway is one of those that has a uh, hidden drive sign. The golf course driveway has a hidden driveway sign. There have been more accidents on this stretch of Spurwink Avenue this year, a month ago, than there was all in the previous year. It's a speedway. I think the police department would agree with that. Let's say you put a swimming pool across the street. Kids wandering across that road, cars clipping along 45. I know it's a 35 zone. Uh, when I go to get my mail out of my mailbox, quite frankly, I have to stop, look, and listen because they're not coming at 35. Parking lot, same thing. Parties at night, people slightly under the weather wandering across the street at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night. Not a terribly good idea. A golf course, maybe, maybe a real golf course. Uh, I'd like to give you a quick history of that piece of land. We, we bought that house about 30 years ago. And shortly thereafter, a 60-acre parcel was sold. It includes this 30 acres. Uh, Dick Davis sold 30 acres to the golf club. The golf club sold it back to Dick Davis. Now it's in his wife's name. The wife sells it back to the club a few years ago. So this isn't something that the club has had since 1927 or something like this. There's a two-acre piece of property right along the front. Uh, it's 500 feet wide and it goes from the Hannigan house to our house. And the original purpose of buying this two acre piece of property, which you could put a nice house on, uh, was to protect the entrance to the club because they have the same problem, windy road, people speeding and so forth. Let's protect the uh, entrance to the club because that makes a lot of sense. Uh, that was in 1941. All these other transactions are fairly recent. 
uh, we've been there 30 years and the property's changed hands three times, twice for the same people. It's sort of back and forth. The property, as I understand it, uh, according I read in the newspaper, the property's for sale. Or they're talking about selling the property to somebody. There is a restriction on the 30 acres, uh, except for the front two acres. There's a restriction you can't build any houses on it. So you could build a golf course on it, you know, technically. But anyway, I think at, at, at the council meeting, I said something about spot zoning or something like this. Uh, I think it's bad enough to, to uh, uh, spot zone this 30 acres across from the club. Uh, uh, the way it is now, if they wanted to do any of these things, they could do them. They could come and propose something, and they could get some kind of a variance to do something like this. And if they would propose something like a golf course, I don't think I would get too enthusiastic about it, but I don't think I'd be jumping up and down. Now, if they came out and said they wanted to put a swimming pool, uh, I would jump up and down and start circulating petitions and so forth. But extending this thing to the whole cave, uh, <clears throat> that's something else again. There's an awful lot of, of area in the cave that you could put. I mean, it's your golf course in. And I don't know if any of you people live in the RA zone, but just think about it if you do. <laughs> you undoubtedly know people who do live in the RA zone. And uh, having somebody put in a miniature golf course, hot dog stand, don't forget the way you've defined it, you could have a miniature golf course, a pitch and putt, uh, lights at night, uh, parking lot, restaurant, almost anything you can think of. So if you're really going to recommend that, which I would strongly suggest you don't do, I would suggest you go back and define the word golf course a lot more carefully. I think I know what you mean. But a good lawyer could just go through this thing and tear it to pieces. And almost anything could be considered a golf course under this particular definition. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is John Mitchell. I represent uh, the Buddha Club. I just want to, and I've, I've mentioned this um, uh, before at, at the workshop meetings, but I just want to remind the board the request, the purpose of our request uh, was basically twofold. The first was to um, allow golf courses to be a permitted use in the RA district. Uh, right now it's a, a non-conforming use and we uh, thought that it would be uh, a good idea to have Kapudik as a conforming use in the RA district. That was the first reason. The second reason um, is, was to come up with a definition to be incorporated in the zoning ordinance that would allow ancillary uses um, so that if the, if the club decides to um, put a, an accessory use in the, on the land across the street in the RB district, that they would be allowed to do that. Um, as far as the definition is concerned, if, if uh, Marine wants to exclude, or if the board wants to exclude uh, miniature golf courses, that's, that's fine. The public doesn't have any interest in developing <coughs> miniature golf courses. Um, and it seems to me that all of those other nuisances that were mentioned, such as uh, lighting and music and traffic, uh, would be addressed during the site plan review process. So, uh, once again, the, those are the, the only two reasons. Um, right now, the Caputa Club would not be allowed to do anything on that, on that piece of land. Um, so that, that was the purpose of our request. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Nobody else wants to say anything. I will draw the hearing. We'll close and uh, open it up for discussion. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'd just like to address the, just so it's clear, the, the, the issue of, of the, the two options, and, and I feel strongly about this because I don't think, it, to me it's a question of fairness, it's a question of 
what would truly be spot zoning in my mind if we came up with a solution that recognizes that the Proputa Club is there and has been there and obviously should be approved for where it is, but then also allows the Proputa Club to extend its use as a golf club in only that portion of the RB district where the Proputa Club wants to expand. Um, I think we either have to say, recognize that the Proputa Club is there and, and obviously should be recognized and grandfathered, uh, or that not only can the Proputa Club expand in the uh, RB district for golf club use, but so can everyone else. Because to me, to, to limit it only to that property is is spot zoning in its most basic form and frankly I don't think would withstand any type of, of review. Um, and we do not have the option as I understand it of, of saying that the Proputa Club can be grandfathered but not allow golf course use anywhere else in the RA district and then allow the limited in the RB district. So our options are only, I think, our only fair options are to grandfather the Proputa Club as it stands only or to allow golf club as a permitted use in both districts if we're going to allow it for the Proputa Club in both districts. And saying all that, I guess where I come out in the end, and I've said this before, but I guess I'll say it here for the record, that I don't have nearly the amount of information or expertise to stand up here tonight and say that golf courses, no matter how you define it, even if it's defined by PGA standards or any other standard, should be allowed in, in all of Cape Elizabeth. I have no information about, about pesticide use and runoff and, and traffic and anything else you can come up with. And I guess my recommendation at this point would be um, uh, option two, because that's addressing the issue, the specific issue that came before us. And if the town council wishes to explore a more universal change uh, to the zoning affecting, as it says here, 57% of the land in town, uh, then I assume they would do so by gathering all of that type of information and exploring it with great specificity. But based on how this issue came to us, which is in the context of the Proputa Club and almost an oversight, um, I'm not willing to go that to go that far. Yeah, I support what John said and feel that if the Proputa Club wants to develop the lot across the street, they should have to go through. If any other citizen was here and owned something across the street that was zoned differently from what they had, they'd have to go in front of the zoning board and get a variance. No? No. Well, go through the process of dealing with that lot by itself. And I certainly would support option two of just allowing the existing golf course to be where it is under the zoning ordinance and putting in a definition if that definition isn't acceptable then rewriting the definition and dealing with the problem of developing the lot across the street when the Paputa Club has plans to develop it and comes before for a request to allow that kind of development in the RB zone. Go ahead Dave. My understanding though uh, Barbara is that they could not get a variance for a uh, use for the RB district, so really, I mean, it's not our decision to make. We're simply making a recommendation. But if the town council were to adopt option two, then I, I think uh, the Perpudic would be precluded from developing that lot in the RB district as a golf course, no matter how we define it. Is that correct? That, that's correct. And we've talked about this, but under Article 51952, which is the powers and duties of the zoning board, where it specifically describes, it's page 48, actually I work on the quote from page 49, describes how you get a variance and what the variance standards are. It specifically says 
notwithstanding definition of dimensional standards, no variance shall be granted, A, to permit a use or structure otherwise prohibited. That means that if you are in a district and you want to do something that is a use that is not listed as a permitted or a conditional use in that district, you cannot do it without a zone change. So there is no way to go to the zoning board and get some relief granted. They are not allowed to do that. It would then come back to us. What would happen then is if someone wanted a use that is not permitted, they would be going through this exact process. They would be asking for an amendment to the zoning ordinance um, to make their use a permitted use. I think I've asked this question before, but that's true regardless of what the Proputa Club wanted to do? I mean, what, why is it that it, it has to be defined as a golf course if if what they want to do across the street is a restaurant, for instance. The, the reason we had the definition of golf course is it, it, it just seemed like good ordinance construction. If you're going to add something to a list and say that golf course is a permitted use, you probably want to define what a golf course is. So just adding golf course as a term to the RA district list of permitted uses is what generated the desire to at least create a definition. So that doesn't really address the RB property on the other side of the road. So what, why is it that they would be prevented from developing in the RB property? It's because it wasn't a golf course. Right. Golf, well, if they wanted to do something with the property across the street, which is in the RB district, you would need to go to the RB district list of permitted uses right. to see what you were allowed to do. And when they said they wanted to do golf course type activities, that's not listed as a permitted use in the RB district either. But, so, but if they said they wanted to put in a restaurant or... Right. They couldn't do that either. Because it's not... It's not a permitted... Not a listed. restaurant is not a permitted but use. But if they the wanted RB to district. do something that was listed, the they fact couldn't. that they're a golf club doesn't matter one way or the other. It doesn't matter who the applicant no. is. That's what I thought. And, and, and let me just say the definition, if we're, as I would recommend, if we're going to basically grandfather for Puda Club, the definition isn't all that, I mean, all that significant. But what we're saying is what's there is allowed. And I, uh, just getting to part two of my comment, though, I agree with, with Barbara on the issue of uh, uh, expanding an approved use to uh, all of the RA and RB districts and echo John's comment. I, I'm not comfortable with the dearth of information we have to make such a sweeping change to our, or to recommend such a sweeping change to our ordinance. Uh, certainly the town council can disagree with our recommendation, uh, but hope, if they do, hopefully they'll have more information before it, uh, certainly more than we have. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a perfect example of the law of unintended consequences uh, in our desire to be responsive to a respected and and uh, you know, important member of the community, the Proputa Club, we tried to craft a proposed zoning change that uh, responded to their desire to use the property that they own across the street. And I actually voted against that recommendation because I thought it was spot zoning. But having had more of an opportunity to think about this and hear the commentary, appreciate Mr. Keller's comments this evening and your patience. Uh, I I concur that you know if it if it's this board is looking at uh, applying the ordinance or you know, make tweaking planning policy, that's one thing. If it's looking at making a sweeping change to what's allowed to go on in the town of Cape Elizabeth, that requires a lot more public input and commentary, and I don't feel comfortable that we've got the information or the charter, for that matter, to make this kind of change. And I realize it's not responsive to the Proputa Club's desire, but I think option two is the only thing we can vote for tonight. Uh, I can possibly give, give a little input here as to the intention, but I don't, I'm not sure that it's going to um, be enough information for you to, any of you to step over, but I think Paputik's issue here is that they have been a good citizen in the town. Um, they provide an opportunity for potential growth for the, the activities that might someday go on on that property to provide to some of the residents of town some facilities that are not available in town. And I'm not sure that this is um, 
the way it should be <coughs> taken care of, but um, I know an awful lot of people that belong to Papudic. I've been a member there for a long time, and I think what they're looking for is basically an opportunity uh, to provide some expansion for some of the things that um, they, they can't do now. Um, I don't think it's anything other than that, and I don't think you could get the majority of the Papudic members t to uh, try to do anything other than that. Uh, they like to play golf, um, and, they, and, it, and I think it's, there aren't many communities that have a facility like this in the town, and to restrict them um, for, from using the property that they own to, to help improve their facility and provide some of the services to the members who live in town and the opportunities, I, um, I can only envision something to maybe having a tennis court there or possibly a swimming pool that the kids in this town are very active swimmers but they don't have any outside place to compete in the summer and I think a place like Paputa Club would be an ideal location to have an outdoor swimming pool and I think that's really what Paputa wants is they want some way to protect their options and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that the town council understands this and uh, respects their, their chances to develop a piece of land that they've owned for a while, but um, haven't had a need to, to expand until recently, and I think they would like to continue to have that option. So I uh, present my two cents for what it's worth to you, but I think that's... Yeah, I, I mean, my position in no way reflects on what the Perputa Club wants to do or, or doesn't want to do. I, I have no reason to believe what they would want to do wouldn't be ex acceptable. I guess my point is I don't believe we should exercise a, a, a zoning concept which says yes we'll allow the Perputa Club to do it but we won't allow anybody else to do it. Mm. Um, and I, I don't know if you saw in our packet of materials there was a there was a an article I believe about with a court decision on spot zoning and, and this is about as clear a example unfortunately of spot zoning as you can get and I, I don't I don't think I don't think it would fly I, I have to agree with you reading that article indicates to me that uh, if this if a decision like this was challenged in court I don't think it would stand up for me it's not a matter of saying no, the Papuda Club shouldn't be allowed to put these other activities on that property. It might be really great for the town. Uh, I, don't, I just don't think that the amount of public input required and the amount of information required to evaluate that has been presented here. And this is one of those rare cases to me where I think it's got to be a matter of, of uh, you know, initiated through, through significant public dialogue and not just sort of snuck through the planning board on a Tuesday night. Hmm. Where do we stand? Where would I have a motion to consider unless there's more discussion? Right ahead. Uh, motion to recommend to the town council uh, that be it ordered that based on the facts presented, the planning board recommends option two of the golf course zoning amendment to the town council for consideration. Second. Motion's been made and second. Any further discussion? And I'll raise it to a vote. All those in favor of option um, of the motion that is in front of us, please uh, show by raising your right hand. All those opposed? Motion carries five to two. And I guess at this point, Maureen will present this to the town council on our behalf. The final item on our agenda is the open space zoning amendment, and we have 15 minutes to get into this subject, otherwise <laughs> 10 o'clock. <laughs> so now that we've started it, uh, we have to finish it. Um, the planning board is initiating an amendment to the zoning ordinance that would clarify how the open zo space zoning requirement Section 19-7-2 are applied to subdivisions in multiple zoning districts. 
The amendment will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-10-3 amendments. At this point, uh, the text of the proposed amendment um, is attached, but I think a brief discussion of it here would be helpful to the audience. The open space zoning requirements promote and regulate the design of clustering for residential development. Taken as a whole, the intent of the provisions is to cluster development in the most appropriate location on a site and preserve large, contiguous land areas as open space. The proposed amendment clarifies that if a subdivision includes two or more zoning districts, the density shall be calculated based on the requirements of each district, and then the actual development location can occur on the parcel independent of the of the zoning district lines as long as the overall development density is not exceeded. So at this point, uh, I guess it's in order to open it to a public hearing. If there is any, uh, I will open a public hearing. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak to this issue, please do so. I, I, I really, I, I would just like to throw out something uh, for just your information. For the record, would you oh, identify your name and? 291 Spurwing. Uh, okay. uh, we, we, we actually live on an island down in Florida, and we've been going through a horrendous problem on the island because of the growth of the population and so forth. And we've got one narrow road uh, for hurricane evacuation and so forth. So the same problem came up. How do we get? development but still leave a lot of the land free and what they've come up with and apparently uh, Florida I think is the only place that has this sort of a thing uh, they go to the developer and says you can have X number of houses per acre if you leave 90 percent of the land free if you want more or okay um, if you leave 60 percent of the land you can build more houses and so forth, you, you give the developer an actual incentive. The more houses he wants, the more tightly he has to build and the more open space he has to leave. Now, this, this was a planning thing with hundreds of people working on it for, for over a year. And it is, has been done a couple of times in Florida. It's now in front of the um, uh, the lead planning board, or actually it's going up to the lead government, which is sort of different from the way we do it around here. It's county government. But uh, the staff has favorably recommended it. And if they do, it will probably change the, the, uh, the way they do development in southern Florida. And it's just a thought. I'm pretty sure it's not characteristic of this part of the world, but you give the developer a real incentive. You put those houses close together, you know, you put a lot of the land, 90%, 80%, 70% of the land, leave it in trees, and you can build a hell of a lot of houses, sort of cluster zoning. If you want to have one house on every two acres, well, you're only going to be able to build seven houses. But if you do it our way, you can build 40 houses. Very attractive. Uh, very attractive to the town. The plan, uh, I'm a land trust down there. Very, very attractive to the land trust, uh, very attractive to the town government, and uh, very attractive to developers. Just a thought. Thank you. Seeing no other individuals interested in speaking, I will close the hearing <coughs> and open up the discussion with the board. Well, Mr. Shrono. It would appear that, that the amendment, um, if anything, promotes uh, a couple of things which I think are important and which I think uh, have been the overall goal of, of the planning goals in, in this town, one of which is it does give some flexibility to promote the sort of cluster development that I believe is what the town has decided they, they want to promote. Um, it's my understanding that without the amendment, it would uh, inhibit such 
cluster development if a development straddles two zones as opposed to encourage that type of development which would in turn leave more open space um, for such a, a development that may straddle two zones than it, than it would otherwise. So uh, given that, that that's what the town has, the direction the town has decided to go, I think the, uh, the amendment's appropriate and, and consistent. Question. Hmm. I don't disagree with the concept of this, but I'm wondering how and why it originated. Did it originate because of the property um, that was just purchased on Wells Road? Apparently there was another court decision down in Southern Maine. I believe the town of Kennebunk was involved where they had a development on, multi on, on a parcel in multiple zoning districts and the development was approved by the planning board clustering all of the development in one of the districts and there was a lawsuit and the judge uh, re remanded the development back to the planning board because it felt that because they had put all of the development in one district, it had exceeded the density in that particular district. Uh, what the planning board then did is, actually what the town did is they amended their ordinance just as we are so that because they had already agreed that this was the best place to put the development on that parcel of land and then reapprove the project the way it was originally designed. So in light of that recent court case and the fact that we may be looking at a similar project, um, it, it seemed like we should be dealing with this issue as well, and that, that's why we're doing it. Would, excuse me. Would you think, would you suggest that possibly it's a way of cleaning up our ordinance and making it a little more? I'd say, I'd say we're just plugging one more loophole that was created by a court decision. Okay. <laughs> well, it also gives us the possibility of moving. I think, well, it, it, in, it in, my, in my opinion, and actually it's not just my opinion, uh, we have in the town uh, studies that we have done on various parcels of land where the intent always was to shift development uh, to the most appropriate place on on the development and uh, that was always the intent when we wrote these regulations I think the concern is now that even though that was always the intent this new court case now raises the issue that we needed to be clearer in our language Any further discussion we have a motion I'll make a motion, Mr. Chairman. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the facts presented, the planning board recommends the open space zoning amendment, section 19-7-2, to the town council for consideration. Do I have to read the whole? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Motion's been made. Uh, Second. And seconded. Do I hear any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll raise it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion before us, please show by raising the right hand. Motion carries. I hear a motion for adjournment. So move. So move. Second. And all those in favor? <laughs> it is adjourned.